Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Emerald Planet. All the ecology news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's your host, Executive Director of the Emerald Planet, Dr. Sam Lee Hancock. Hello, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of Emerald Planet, Emerald Planet TV, as we come to you on a week-to-week -week basis from Washington, D.C. and the United States. As we look around the globe in 144 different nations, looking for those thousand best practices, technologies, services, and products as we move through the 21st century. And today we're going to be talking about India up close and personal. I was there for almost uh, a month, and we were traveling uh, throughout the entire country looking in very large mega cities like Mumbai and Delhi, which are both uh, almost 30 million people each in those cities all the way down to small villages of less than 300 people and everything in between. And it's a very interesting uh, country, very dynamic, and of course it's an ancient culture so that adds to the spark, the, the, uh, the sizzle if you will, and just the general uh, feel of everything that goes on there. It's just a very vibrant place. And sitting right beside me is uh, Richard and he goes by Rich uh, Winfield Lewis. Uh, he is the president of the Winfield Group and also the chief technology officer for Augur Marketing. And also he's a regular here on Emerald Planet TV as our, I guess what we now, we've labeled you the environmental special guest. Is that what we're- Sustainability advocate. Oh my gosh, we got time. more to the title. Okay, <laughs> anyway, welcome back. Thank Good you. to have you here. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to be talking about India today, and this is really going to be a conversation. So uh, we uh, had so many interviews. I think we ended up doing over 30 uh, television interviews over there in different areas, Rich. And it's just amazing what's going on in that country. And to see that uh, India is about ready to go by China as far as population, almost 1.4 billion. Actually, some people say it's already happened. And, really? and they're the, you know, according to wow. the IMF and others, mm. they're the third largest uh, market on the, on the planet right. and right behind China and the United States. So it's just interesting, all the things that are going on over there. So thank you for joining me. Thank you. Yeah, it's a huge economy and big population and they have a lot to contend with. Well, and that's absolutely true. And we have this first map on here of India, and you just see how spread out it is. And uh, look at all the neighbors. It has, uh, you know, Sri Lanka right below it. Uh, and then you have China, you know, its mm -hmm. uh, northern neighbor, and Pakistan. You know, it's a very active neighborhood to be in. It is. And Bangladesh on the other side. Yeah. Well, actually, Bangladesh just kind of cuts right up through there like a knife. Mm -hmm. And of course, you remember back at partitioning how that, you know, Pakistan, Bangladesh actually were the same country for a right. while. And then they uh, split and went their ways, and of course, just like they broke off from India and itself. A quick side note Bangladesh now has its own problems <coughs> related to sea level rising, which can impact India. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the one thing about it too, Rich, is that when I was over in uh, Bangladesh a few years ago, is I was standing in uh, Dhaka in the capital city and uh, the president of the Chamber of Commerce said, look across the street. And I looked across the street and it just looked like, you know, it was busy and, you know, it was on a corner and all that. And I said, okay. And he says, that's where the Bay of Bengal may be in about 20 to 30 years, by wow. 2050. And if it is, about 50 million Bangladeshis will be displaced. And guess where most of them will be going? India. Going and right I, across the border in India and I, Kolkata. I read one estimate that said it may be as many as 75 million. Yeah. I, I, and it, we're know. already seeing that with the refugees. And see, that's up from what he was telling me because that was the, the best and the, and the brightest, mm. you know, came up with that through the UN right. as far as the 50 million. And now it's 75 million. So it's, it's just like if you look at this map, uh, half of that country is almost right at sea level. And Half so, of Bangladesh. yes. Oh, wow. And so, when you look at it, and then and all the rivers are going through there, and then uh, the flooding that happens through the monsoon, and of course they re removed a lot of the the uh, mango swamps that usually break would break the typhoons and uh, the heavy winds and things like that. So it's. Uh, and you I can mean, look it's at a, India. It's a, it's a big area to 
say grace over it, but well, go ahead. I was just say you can look at India and see that most of that country has a coastline. Mm -hmm. And if you don't include Alaska, their coastline is twice as large as that of the United States. So if you have sea level rise, you're impacting at least 7 million people who currently live on the coastline in India. Yeah, and I saw that statistic. You shared that with me, and, and that's, I mean, you did a fantastic job in research, and I saw the, you know, the, the quote on that. But if you look at uh, Mumbai itself, it's 30 million. Right, well, they said up to 40 million could be impacted. They're not, they're not including people that sort of live away from the I India see. coast. Okay. It's just those people live right on the coast yeah. right now. Not, not on the hills, because as you right. know, Mumbai goes up and down, undulating, and we drove all over that city about six or seven times yes. finding places. Uh, but if you look all around there, it's just like most countries. We have uh, major seaports, and mm -hmm. you have all that, and that infrastructure is going to be as challenged as what we have in the United States. And, you know, if you look down at Norfolk, which is the, the largest uh, military uh, Navy seaport in the world, uh, they're already building everything up three feet. Wow. So already doing that because uh, it floods uh, on a weekly basis along the, mm -hmm. the, the uh, road that goes around uh, Norfolk, Virginia. And so, uh, there, that. you know, that's just a warning of, of things mm -hmm. to come. But looking at this, uh, Rich, when you look at this map, you see all these states and all that. What do you see? What do you know about uh, what we're looking at here? Anything that strikes you? Uh, well, di diversity of uh, climates, diversity. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a huge country, mm -hmm. uh, lots of different areas, some warm, some cooler. Mm -hmm. I uh, used to be very forested, not so much anymore, surrounded by water. Um, lots of big cities, mega cities, and a huge population. They have a lot to contend with. Yeah. There is good news, but uh, India is going <coughs> through what the U.S. did without the time frame. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, everything is collapsing time, particularly when you have almost 1.4 billion people. And a lot of have impoverished to deal people who yeah. don't have the infrastructure. Well, and that's why we're going to, you know, we got some good news and all that, and that's what I found out when I was over there, and this, is, uh, this will highlight the states. There's 29 states, and, of course, you got uh, Delhi, the capital. Uh, new and old Delhi, and I was looking at the statistics on that while I was actually in Delhi, and uh, New Delhi was built a long time ago, so <laughs> By <American laughs> they, they, they probably need yes. a newer, newer Delhi than mm -hmm. what they have, but it's, it's, it's really, uh, you know, a very beautiful. But the whole thing about this, the diversity you're talking about, uh, diversity of crops, uh, diversity as far as uh, ethnicities. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, each one of these states actually are like little mini countries, so they have their own language. And so, you know, most of the people are linguists. They, you know, speak English, they'll speak Hindi, and then they'll speak two or three of the, the local languages. Mm -hmm. And each one of those uh, has a, a local language. And uh, so it's it just the diversity is just incredible. And uh, going from Delhi, you know, again, 30 million, Mumbai, 30 million, and then going out into the area in Rajasthan because we were in the high desert plains. I was about to ask you, where were you on your three-week trip? Well, when you, when you look at this, and it was almost, uh, almost four weeks, uh, if I had a mark, uh, pointer, that would be great. But anyway, we were in virtually the whole center of the country. Mm. So we were in uh, some of the, uh, the largest states in there. And then also some of the smaller ones, like Haiana, spent a lot of time there with the, uh, the Sagal Foundation. Uh, they're doing really good work. Uh, they have 300,000 uh, farmers and 300 villages that they're working with. And then we're in Bahramanti, which is in Maharashtra State, which is one of the most populous, but also one of the higher income areas. That's where Mumbai sits. And um, you, can, you can see everything there. But the one thing I noticed is the, we were at the Agricultural Demonstrations and Expo in Baramonte, and just how prosperous the farmers looked. You hear about how poor the farmers are and yeah. they're stressed and the high suicide rates and all that. Right. Uh, we were there, 350,000 farmers that came to that event in four days. I mean, it was wow. just like a sea of people just washing over you. So I stood out in the middle of the, the main street, right next to uh, where we had our uh, small booth set up. And people, it was just like, I mean, literally, it's just like a, an ocean just flowing by you. 
Wow. And, and it just went for four days. You're right about the images. The only images I've seen on American press are impoverished people, and they talk about the problems, never about the huge growing middle class and the Well, wealthy. the interesting thing about India, and we're going to leave this map up here because uh, we've just about gone through this, but I think it's uh, of interest. They have 375 million true middle class. Well, guess what? That's more in the whole population of the United States <laughs> as a middle class. So you've got real buying power. Mm -hmm. And then the farmers, which are about 500 million of that one point, uh, say, 4 billion people. Uh, Moti, who is, you know, in charge of that country now, wants to double their income by 2022. That's ambitious. And they are working at it. I mean, they are really working at it. And it's just interesting to see it. But this is some of the statistics, and we can just throw this up here because uh, uh, you were a great guy and came up with it. But when you look at the growth rate, Rich, just tell us about that in comparison with China and the United States. Well, it's, it's growing rapidly, supposed to surpass t uh, China as far as population by 2028, according to the UN. But mm -hmm. like you said, different estimates, and it's very hard to calculate. Yeah. Um, the economy is one of the strongest in the world. Mm -hmm. I think sixth largest by GDP, but also third largest as far as right. buying power. Yeah. And I'm assuming that's China and America ahead of India. Yeah. Well, uh, actually, you're looking at China now. They're saying, predicting that's going to be down, you know, in the, the low sixes. And uh, that's a real problem, you know, because with their population, even though they're not growing, I mean, China has the fastest aging population on the planet even mm. more so than Japan. Uh, and India is a very young population uh, comparison. But when you go there and you see these 375 million middle class, you know, meet people there, they're just like most families, just like what Mexico went through. They had six and a half children as, a, as family size. Now they're wow. down to 2.3, mm. and that's in 30 years. Well, the Indians are gonna, you know, be faster at that. Right. Because they're traveling more. I mean, when you go to the airports, I uh, was there uh, about eight years ago, back now. They started, had brand new airports, a year old, most of them, and they were tripling the size. Wow. Tripling the size, not doubling, tripling the, the size. The, yeah, the economic growth in India is pretty impressive. It's at, what was it? Uh, no. Oh, it's, you mean economic growth? Yeah, it's yeah, 6%. It's in a, no, it's 7. Oh, yeah, 7%. It's almost uh, 7, 3, 7, 5, something like and that. America's at 4%. And yeah. China has dropped to the yeah. 6%. That's what it was. Yeah, right? and the whole thing about this, too, if you could find out the money and all those small shops they have, I mean, they have millions of these small businesses. So it's, it's a country of small business, really. And they have some really, some of the largest corporations on the planet. It's just, the diversity is incredible. But anyway, Rich, uh, thank you for just going over some of this as far as what India, where it is. We're going to talk now uh, the next uh, show about what's happening there as we create the Emerald Planet. Every time I hear the alarm bell go off in school, I think it's an air raid. A lot of houses in our neighborhood have been destroyed. I like to close my ears and sing songs whenever the bombs come close. I'm worried our new neighbors won't like us. But I know it's all going to be worth it. I just want my family to be safe. But these are not my these words. These are not my words. These are not my words. One day these rats will play in the woods. One of the best is a fast smoke gun. Listen to smoke before you give it a try. Only you. Don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Only you can prevent wildfires. Fire. How far would you go to protect the planet? I want you to build an ark. Here we go. Okay, that's good. Oh, okay. Ow. Oh, oh. Maybe there's another way. People, the flood is imminent. Is it too much to ask for a little precipitation? Go to fightglobalwarming.com to find out what you and your community can do to reduce global warming pollution. When it comes to saving money, ah, what? Don't act like a baby. Oh, it's like they're having their own little meeting. 
This is so humiliating. Be the boss. I'm the boss. What the? Mm -hmm. Power nap. You were saying. And make a budget. Let's get to work. Need a little help? Stacy, read back the notes. I can't read. What's it say? Create a personalized savings plan and get other tools and tips. We can share. You obviously didn't go to business school. At feedthepig.org. To the Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of Emerald Planet, the Emerald Planet TV, and we're looking at those thousand best practices, the technology, services, products, and the processes that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And I was just in the country of uh, India for almost one month traveling from you know one of the two largest mega cities one is Mumbai which went goes by actually it goes by Bombay more now than I've ever heard in the uh, last 20 or 30 years and then of course Delhi which is the new and old city and uh, just absolutely dynamic and both of these are just almost like a heartbeat you just feel it with all these people around you and even though you're there you're constantly around people Still, it seems like there's, there's space for you, and it's just a very interesting dynamic. Uh, this is Richard Lewis. He goes by the name of Rich. He's on Emerald Planet TV on a regular basis. Helps us as uh, now he's, got, he's adding more titles to himself, but sustainability guru and, and uh, environmental special guest. And also he has his own organization, the Winfield Group. He's the president of that and also Chief Technology Officer as far as our marketing and, and on Emerald Planet TV. What better way to do that? But what we're going to do is we're talking about the country of India, which I was uh, sharing about that just a few seconds ago, Rich. And we talked about where it was, the map, and all those kinds of things. But now we're going to talk about some of the uh, challenges they have over there. And we have this image of a, you know, a burning uh, open uh, garbage pit, actually. And this, even though when you get there, you don't really see this, this is actually going on. Mm -hmm. And when you travel through the country, you really do see it, particularly when you get out in some of their smaller communities and talk about that. But this is the list that uh, you and I have been uh, chatting about, all the things that we have here. And the interesting thing about this, Rich, is you got, you know, the air pollution, you know, management of poor management of waste, growing water scarcity, all these things. I mean, all these are 100% true. Uh, but what, you know, through the 50 different communities I traveled in uh, some of these very large agricultural demonstrations and the expos, I mean, they're just absolutely embracing all these and trying to do something about it. And that's what was really interesting about being over there and in that society because uh, they realized that, you know, they're choking themselves to death with all these cars. Right. Uh, we're going to see a scene of that. And, and I was in it on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, you would be at a stoplight, and you'd be there, let's say you're one or two deep in the line, and by the time the light got ready to change, there'd be maybe 10 vehicles in front of you. And these are cars, trucks, right. uh, mopeds, motorcycles. I mean, it's just so it's, it's just absolutely incredible. Yeah, a lot of congestion <laughs> and uh, very dense cities, uh, less pollution control, so they're facing a lot. Yeah, in, yeah, in yeah. India. Yeah, and going back to this, this whole thing too, as uh, far as this, uh, and we have some images that you shared with us. You know, this whole thing of climate refugees, uh, IDPs, internally displaced persons, is something that uh, they're called as far as, uh, you know, the UN is concerned. You know, it's, it's a very real concern for China because it's not like uh, the Bangladeshis, which have to come across the border into India. Because when you're in Kolkata, which is, you know, the uh, city there, uh, you know, the British Empire Famous where actually it actually started, right. and it's right next door to um, uh, Bangladesh, there's six million Bangladeshis along the railroad tracks. Wow. And they're hanging eight, 10, 12 deep in hammocks, and that's their whole house. The hammock is their and house. And I've seen the footage of coal <coughs> markets along the railroad track and they pull up when the train goes by and flop it back down. So you're living in a tent when you hear the train. Yeah, you're you living in a, in a hammock, actually, not even a tent. Right, in a hammock, 
All right, but for the markets, they have a little tent stall. And oh, yes, that's correct. When the train comes correct. through, you lift it up, the train goes by, and you put it back. That's how densely populated it is. Yeah, it's and crazy. it's just amazing. And, and they're there because they just have no place to go. And, right. of course, the constant flooding that you have in Bangladesh, and as you and I were talking about earlier, uh, the estimate I heard by the Chamber of Commerce, 50 million could be uh, displaced by 2050, and you read 75 million, right. and many of these people are already walking. And that's just from sea level rise and water climate refugees, mm -hmm. and we also have deforestation, deforestation, I can't say it, which is causing a different kind of refugee, which ends up in the cities, which are already overpopulated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and the whole thing about it is you have uh, Kolkata, which uh, again is, you know, is uh, another one of these uh, mega cities. You know, it's 10 to 20 million or something like that. Actually, nobody really knows what the real numbers are because there's so many from Bangladesh there that mm. you know they're they just can't count them and they're just right. absolutely everywhere but looking at the climate change we have on that and the sea level rise you're talking about you know it's just some of these numbers it's just like you were talking about earlier the seven million are going displaced by sea level rise you know I think that number is grossly understated when you're in these these cities mm -hmm. and you see these areas and you know, you're looking at the ocean, and it's actually, you know, on a calm day, it may be one or two feet below. Right. You realize that, uh, you and know, you there's see a, a sea of people. Yeah. Up until the ocean, so yeah, one of the estimates said there was 40 million people that would be impacted. Yeah, yeah, and this is the, and like you have this number here, the one you talked about. Your consists 75 million, and uh, this is, you know, kind of the best uh, guesstimates. Uh, but then you look at India as far as the fifth largest uh, emitter of emissions because they have so many huge coal-fired plants there. Right. And it's a very low-grade coal, so it's actually smoking. But the one thing I learned while I was there, it's not just the coal-fired fire, power plants, it's all the brick kilns because they make uh, many oh, or wow. most of their homes out of brick. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, and what they're yeah. doing is taking the lowest-grade coal and they put them in, you know, into these kilns. And so when you're driving down the highway, I saw 10 of these together. Oh, wow. And then what you have is that you have this huge curling black smoke going off, and it's going literally into the horizon. Wow. And so that's terrible. one of them. That's just one, And then right. you got another one that's doing the very same thing. And so when you get there, you realize that we you know, keep blaming everything on power plants, but there's a whole lot of other things that are going on, plus you know, just the hundreds of millions of the of the vehicles they have. But this is one of the issues. In this area, this looks like what I drove across almost for four weeks. I was about to ask you if you had seen that because when I was there a long time ago, I didn't see any land degradation or deforestation. I saw the poverty mm -hmm. and some of the pollution, but not that. Yeah, yeah, this, the, if you're looking at, because we were traveling through uh, Rajasthan, uh, the western part of Maharashtra the state, uh, Haryana, uh, and uh, we're in Chishtagar, uh which is actually a new name for a state that was uh, divided recently. So you have all these states, and, and it's just like no matter where you go, it's like you're on a high desert plain. Oh, wow. And it doesn't mean you're that high above sea level. It's just the fact it's just bloody dry. And the water table in some cases is, you know, it's hundreds of feet, sometimes it's thousands of feet below the surface. And so we're going to talk about the solutions to all this. We're putting these up here as far as what's going on. But one of the main things, this land degradation, is that we saw uh, through the agricultural displays and expos. I mean, it was almost like a mantra. The farmers would come and see you, and you talk about the issues and all that. It's just uh, soil fertility and the low quality of the soil. Right. And so this whole thing of how do we enhance the soil, how do we reduce chemical fertilizers and pesticides, I mean, it's just a mantra. You just hear it. The elected officials are saying it. The farmers are saying it. The merchants, the, you, you go into the marketplace and see the vegetables, and they talk about, you know, we have to have better vegetables right. that doesn't have the residue from the pesticides and, all and the insecticides. Food is tainted. Yeah. And they're facing the same things we did in, in the sixties in the US and yeah. overcame a lot of them, but they still have to get take that next step. Yeah. And that's and that, and they're actively at it. And then you see this too, just like this, you know, as far as the water is mm. concerned, uh, you know, a lot of pollution uh, you see a lot of the towns where they, uh, you know, there's there's no drainage system and all that. Right. So the street, uh, 
so uh, the field, right. the the shop, everything is just in one you know mass area. Uh, but everywhere you go, you just see construction going on. You know, and toxic just, waste and yeah, right, yeah. all that. And then, uh, you know, freshwater resources, we've talked about that. But, you know, that's a real thing. Even when you go to the schools now, mandatory, they teach them how to wash their hands. You know, this whole thing of soap and Great. water and all that. Fantastic. And that's, uh, uh, you know, it's just what's needed. But this is the, one of the real issues, deforestation. And this is something you said that, you know, when you were there years ago, you didn't see it. Uh, but now you see it everywhere. Wow. And uh, this is happening whether it's in the jungle areas up towards the Himalayas. Such a green, you know. or I remember it as being very green and forested. Yeah. This picture is terrible. <laughs> and yeah. uh, it's, you know, it's very different than that. It's very dry because, you know, the whole country's drying out. You've got so many uh, people now that are drawing from the aquifers. Mm. Uh, the monsoons are shorter. They're and coming more sporadic. Underground water. Yeah. People yeah. Who don't know. Yeah. And then uh, the water is becoming more and more brackish as they're using vast amounts for irrigation to provide for the food. And more toxic and more polluted. Yeah. And right. also, you look at some of the land, it just looks white because of all the salt crystals that are oh, coming gosh. out from the underground aquifers because mm -hmm. they've gone down now to so the, deep. the brine. Yeah. And so it's just, and here, like it says, the native forest, 2.7% per year. And that might not seem like a lot, but when you do that for 20 or 30 years, that starts to add oh, up. Oh, absolutely. That's a lot of deforestation. Oh, yeah. And that's, and, and they're trying to get at this in the cities. They're trying to plant trees, get more mm -hmm. under canopy because the cities are so hot. Uh, because uh, in the summertime in Delhi and Mumbai, it's 48 Celsius. Now, 48 Celsius translates in 122 degrees Fahrenheit, and, and, very, and that's a day-to-day -day basis. Very briefly, I know you know the answer to this, but why are trees so important? Well, the, the whole thing is transpiration, you know, because you can capture, you know, the, the rain as it comes in, but also it's producing oxygen, uh, it's capturing the carbon, capturing putting that carbon, into right. the ground. So, I mean, the trees are just critical for everything. But we're going to end up on this, and this is exactly the right place to be, unbridled urbanization. Uh, when I first went to India, about 75% of the people there were farmers. Now it's uh, right at 50% and dropping because people are doing this. What we right. see right here in this photograph, they're moving in. This is the kind of the traffic I was sitting in. Uh, almost the whole time I was in India. And I just remember look at seeing it. this too. It's just <laughs> bodies and people and cars everywhere yeah. mixed in with cows. Well, the one thing you don't <laughs> find anymore, and when I first went there, you had cows everywhere, particularly in Kolkata. Now, you don't see that at oh, all really? anymore. In the very small villages, you'll see that. Uh, but in the large cities, they got rid of all that. Uh, they have special places to take them gotcha. uh, because you're not supposed to kill them and, and all <laughs> that. But this is Richard Lewis. Richard, thank you for uh, being with us and let me reminisce about being in India for almost a month and all the things we're seeing and now we're going to start talking about all the the bright spots and the good the things good that are news. going on because there's a lot happening there as we create the emerald planet for all the papas out there let's stop what we're doing and take a moment to be with our kids they can be loud moments goofy moments dorky moments it doesn't really matter every time dads take a moment to be with their kids it's pretty momentous so let's all take a moment to make a moment today Hey, did you know that 2.4 million loving cats and dogs in shelters and rescues need our help to find a home? Go to the shelterpetproject.org and search your local shelters and rescues. Go for a cuddle with your next best friend. Adopt. Okay, so we drowned the fire, yep. stirred it, mm -hmm. drowned it again, mm -hmm. and now just feel if it's cold. Yeah. Cool. Smokey just gave me a bear hug. I know. I already posted it. We cannot be bystanders. We can stop to make sure someone is okay. We can warn someone when their drink isn't safe. And disrupt the situation. We can. Get someone the cab. Or walk them home safely. We can make campuses safer for our friends. Our roommates. Our, our classmates, classmates. Our, our fellow, fellow human, human beings. beings. We cannot be bystanders. We can intervene. It's on us. All of us. Learn how and take the pledge at itsonus.org. 
When it comes to saving money, uh, what? Don't act like a baby. Oh, it's like they're having their own little meeting. This is so humiliating. Be the boss. I'm the boss. What the? Mm -hmm. Power nap. You were saying. And make a budget. Let's get to work. Need a little help? Stacy, read back the notes. I can't read. What's it say? Create a personalized savings plan and get other tools and tips. We can share. You obviously didn't go to business school. At feedthepig.org. to the Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello, and welcome back to the Emerald Planet as we come to you on a week-to-week -week basis uh, looking at 144 different nations, and we're gonna be talking specifically about the country of India, a very rapidly growing society, a huge population base of almost 1.4 billion people. And now we learn that it's uh, actually probably the third largest economy on the planet and that's a, without knowing how many of the millions of small shop owners, how much they're really making and what they're contributing into society. And that's something that the current government uh, of India is trying to figure out because uh, it could be very well they're the second largest economy on the planet. But uh, time will tell and it's a very interesting place. But sitting right beside me is uh, uh, Richard, goes by Rich Lewis. He is president of uh, the Winfield Group and Chief Marketing uh, Officer as far as the Agra Marketing. And then he is the Environmental Special Guest. And I think you added something, you're the Sustainability Guru. Uh, oh, what, what did you add to advocate. it? Advocate. You called me that one time. <laughs> <laughs> sustainability title. Advocate. That, that's a good title. But anyway, uh, won't you just kick off on this? This is some of your information you're going to share. I had a chance to see all this when I was actually over in India. So, good news, sure. Richard Lewis, take so it away. We've talked about the general idea behind India today and the geography and what they're facing as far as sustainability issues, but the good news is that they are tackling everything aggressively and they have great goals uh, with uh, Modi in charge. Um, everything that we talked about, the pollution and the water and the deforestation, uh, they are doing two things at once. One is they are the most aggressive, uh, one of the most aggressive countries on the planet as far as changing that situation, becoming more sustainable, mm -hmm. but they are also lifting a whole lot of people out of poverty and giving them power and electricity and clean water. So it's a, a great effort on a lot of fronts. Uh, they have wind power programs, the largest solar wind project in the world ongoing right now. Um, this incredible program with LED lights, they're mm -hmm. replacing all of the street lights in India and a lot of the households with LED lights in four years, which is amazing. Yeah. And they've dropped the cost uh, by 80% during that time. Uh, I've calculated it somewhere, that's the equivalent of a mil over a million homes, is that right? I don't know. Yeah, it's gotta be much right? larger than that. Three yeah. million, three million mm -hmm. homes will, uh, that, that can power all of Manhattan uh, every day. That's just <laughs> crazy, the, the amount of power they're saving. They're the gonna be saving as far as LED lights, and that's very, very important. So, and, and the whole thing about yeah. that, you know, everything that they're doing over there is just, uh, you know, trying to do better and do it faster. But that's why you were there. So mm -hmm. what did you see when you were there in India for almost four weeks? Yeah, well, the thing, everything you're talking about, let me get over to one of these images. This is one of the things here. This is all about forestation. And you see that everywhere, people talking about trees, trying to plant trees. But also, just like uh, the trees, they're putting gardens absolutely everywhere. So all the schools now are coming up with their own gardens. Fantastic. Uh, they're producing food uh, for the school itself. And they're actually trying to get it so that they can actually produce even more than enough. They can sell in the local markets to start earning income uh, for the schools. But the school children, you see these green outfits, they have the green and white. Uh, this is something that you just see, you know, everywhere as far so as that's the, very intentional. I didn't realize that. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah. It's mm. just, I mean, they're just, it's amazing what they're doing as a society. I mean, it's the world's largest democracy. It's a very noisy place. 
Uh, I mean, they're, you know, in some ways, uh, you know, they're very quiet and serene. Others are very loud and boisterous. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a noisy democracy. But at the same time, they're very purposeful. And so it's just, it's a, it's a fun, fun time to be there. And so you talk about, you know, the planting of trees and, and all that. But why don't you talk about the carbon credits? This is something that uh, India is going after in a big way, and the United States is getting left behind right. by virtually a, everybody on the it's planet. It's a shame. And really, virtually every country on the planet, except for North Korea and America. Mm -hmm. So Ameri every other country has carbon credits. And the way they work is that a company or industry can decide that they will only uh, generate so much carbon mm -hmm. with their efforts, whatever they're doing. <coughs> if they go over, then they have to buy more carbon credit from a different company, a company that is a good steward and only produces X number of carbon, which is less than their uh, quota, mm -hmm. can then sell that to another company, which did not do as well. So you have very strong economic incentives and this is by country, by industry, by company. America did not do that. So we do have some great uh, private organizations that are doing this. In Chicago, they have one. Mm -hmm. But basically, if you, you set your own limit, you try to reduce your carbon output. If you don't meet that limit, if you start going over, you have to buy more credit from a different country, right. company, sorry that performed better as far as carbon output. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can actually buy it, you know, for as far as the uh, countries uh, as well, right. because, you know, many people here in the United States, they want to reduce their carbon footprint or they want to do the carbon credits, so they're planting trees in Brazil or they're planting trees in Bhutan or, you know, country of India and, and all that. And that's, this will give you a little bit of the, the good news as far as, uh, you know, the carbon credits are concerned. Uh, but one of the things that uh, Washington, D.C., right where we are, Rich, is they have a, actually for a uh, stewardship of stormwater retention, and they have stormwater retention credits I didn't that know you that. can buy in that. So this is something that is uh, unique to Washington, D.C., and it's actually being looked at by you know, communities all over the United States and around the world. But going back to this carbon credits, this is something that they're doing. It's an open democracy. And uh, they're in some ways as much or more free market than the United States is, particularly in this, you know, to meet the, the, uh, right. the uh, Paris protocols as far as uh, limiting uh, climate change. So it's something that's, that's very, very important. Uh, UNESCO's, what are these? Right, these are great. And India is the pioneer, um, promotes them more than anybody else and utilizes them. They're companies that were formed specifically to make a profit by saving money on clean energy, by saving consumer money on mm -hmm. clean energy. So if you lower the cost of clean energy, uh, you earn a profit. And they popped up all over India. Some of them are huge and they're doing an incredible job. The, the one that we're showcasing for this show, I forgot the name of it specifically, <coughs> but they are the ones that have reduced the price of LED lighting by 80% in mm -hmm. a few years and they're also helping to implement the change from traditional lighting to LED lighting all around the country and every single street light in India. It's a huge project. They're on track. The goal is to be done in four years. Yeah. And also, too, you can put uh, LEDs as far as stop lights are concerned, so you're using much less uh, power there. And then also, too, they're trying to have more and more of the stop lights, the street lights, all that, to have their own uh, solar collectors and power that. So the thing of having LED is that you're actually making, you know, the drawdown of the power. In other words, instead of having incandescent lights, mm -hmm. or just like the studio, this studio is all incandescent lights and this had to be chilled in order to make it habitable mm. you know when you're doing the TV program right. now it's LED it's very comfortable it is comfortable and I'm it not sweating. actually be a little right. bit cool at the same time oh. but uh, having these energy efficient companies this is an, go ahead can I mention one more thing about you the LEDs? mention whatever you want at go the ahead. same time in India that they're rolling <laughs> out the LEDs they're also rolling out electricity to places that never had it before mm -hmm and implementing the LED lights all at the same time. They say it's a mixed economy because they have a traditional Western economy like America, 
but they're also lifting all of these people out of poverty and giving them power and clean water. Yeah, yeah. And uh, lifting people out of poverty you know, it goes back to those 500 million plus uh, farmers they're talking mm -hmm. about and giving them a livable, livable wage. And what they're doing there is that they, uh, they're going organic as fast as they can go. Wow. And this is, you know, the farmers across the country. Uh, they're also doing, uh, you know, very intervention ways as far as drip irrigation, uh, even using it for sugarcane now wow. instead of flooding. Neat. And uh, then with the, the vegetables and, and trees and all that. So it's just an amazing country what they're doing and how they're just embracing new technologies. I mean, you've got farmers there in the fields with oxen plowing and they're talking about drip irrigation. Right, which is amazing. You can, drip irrigation only saves <coughs> water, but it also can use unpotable water, like dirty water mm -hmm. for the drip yeah. irrigation yeah. because yeah, plants water. don't care. Yeah, yeah, and the whole thing about too is what they're doing is that they're, they're limiting the amount of fertilizer because it's going through the drip irrigation. So it's putting, you know, a minute amount of fertilizer to that plant and it's uh, predetermined how much it's going to get. And also with precision agriculture, which they're now also doing with satellites, they can fly, you know, sweep over the land to, okay, you need potash here, you need more nitrogen over there, you need phosphorus somewhere right. else. And uh, so they can actually tailor, you know, all that to it. So that's helping the groundwater as well. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, this is all about the LED uh, initiative. Right. And I'm glad you brought that up because that's something that's critically important. And we went through some of that. Mm -hmm. And this is something that you brought to my attention. This is huge. Tell us about this. It's literally huge. <coughs> the largest solar hybrid wind power plant or project, they call mm -hmm. it a project, it's not a plant, it's a huge area. Right. And all they did was, it's like, it is a wind power farm and a solar farm. It's a flat, dusty area that had no use whatsoever and so they just converted it into an energy generator. Mm -hmm. And is this the one I think where we said that it's the equivalent of four Hoover dams already generating power, and that's the three million homes, I believe, if my math is right. Yeah. And it's not even finished, and they're already powering the equivalent of three million homes. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's, it's incredible that they're putting this, this much effort into it, and it's successful. I don't have I don't have enough good things to say about it. Yeah, and what I like about this, and we're just about running out of time, but if you look at this photograph with all these solar panels, this the land that you see behind this, this is exactly what I was driving across almost for 24 days. In every direction, we were going north, south, east, west. And, uh, and this is about what you are seeing on a regular basis because, you know, it's just so dry. Now, they do have jungles, and uh, you go up to Himalayas, they got glaciers, and they have all these other kinds of things. But the interior of India looks a lot, you know, this, this color of this right. brown soil that we, we have there. But anyway, Rich, thank you for sharing this information with us, and thank you for being on the Emerald Planet TV. This is Richard Lewis, and he's the Winfield Group and also Augur Marketing, a good friend of Emerald Planet. He comes on with us with a regular basis, and we'll call him the Environmental Special Guest. And it's always good to have you with us. Thank you. And thank you for being with us as we look at the country of India, the good things that are going on there as we create the Emerald Planet. Too many women get hit by their boyfriends and husbands. Too many women are pressured into having unprotected sex. Half of the people in the world living with AIDS are women. It doesn't have to be this way. Together, we can change this reality. Let's strive for a world free of violence. At Volunteers of America, we don't just give kids a way to stay off the streets. We give them the tools they need to reach their full potential. We don't just help the elderly receive needed care. We help them live life to the fullest. We don't just provide food for homeless individuals and families. We provide job training and placement so they can buy groceries. Volunteers of America is a national organization that for over a hundred years has provided programs and services that allow people to overcome their challenges to become vital members of their community. At Volunteers of America, 
we don't just help people. We help people help themselves. Find out how you can support the programs that are working in your community. Contact Volunteers of America today. Call 1-800-899-0089. Drivers face all kinds of distractions. Guys, 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 guys. Stop, stop playing. No. Before your wireless phone becomes one of them, stop. <laughs> Drive safely. Keep your phone in easy reach and dial sensibly. In bad weather or traffic, call later and use a hands-free device. Remember, with wireless, safety is your call. Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet TV as we come to you on a week-to-week -week basis from Washington DC and the United States as we look around the globe in 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices, technology, services, products, and processes as we move through the 21st century. I am the uh, President and Executive Director of Emerald Planet, the Emerald Planet TV. And I have sitting right beside me is uh, Richard. He goes by Rich Winfield uh, Lewis. He is the president of uh, Winfield Group and also he's the chief marketing uh, officer for Auger Marketing and uh, sustainable uh, advocate for uh, the planet, right? Right. And then also the uh, environmental special guest for the Emerald Planet TV. So we're glad to have you here. But Rich, this week we're talking about India because I just got back from there. Uh, 24 days in country. Uh, I met, uh, I don't know how many thousands of people because I was at uh, some of these uh, national and international agricultural demonstration days as they call them. Some of them were four days, some were five days. And uh, one of them had 350,000 people. In another almost one. four weeks. That's a yeah, long time. Yeah, I tell you, that's, and we went through a lot of communities. And I say 50, but that's really an understatement because uh, we may be in 10 different places in, in one day. Because mm -hmm. we'd start at 7 in the morning and go all the way till, you know, 11 o'clock and head back in into town. But I wanted to kick off with this, uh, this scene here, Rich. We think of India, we think of it as a dry place, which I've talked about that. Mm -hmm. uh, we think about it as uh, you know ancient society and people plowing with oxen right. and all that, which right. they still are. Uh, also, you see lots of modern tractors. Uh, but this is the Mbaramanti, and this is the Agricultural Development Trust, which it goes by the Indian KVK. And this is what you're looking at. Now this is one of the largest research stations in all of India. There's 110 acres. Wow. And, and uh, I say we're looking for a thousand best practices on Emerald mm -hmm. Planet TV. Right. There are a thousand best practices <laughs> right there. here. It's right beautiful here. Beautiful property. Yeah, and uh, this has been evolving over the three generations now. Mm. So it goes back to the, the 1940s and really predated that when the British were still there, you know, as the colonial power as far as bringing water into this area. Uh, but there's 110 acres and they have, you can see uh, in the background there, the hot houses. Yeah, that's a uh, Indian Dutch uh, joint venture. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, some German uh, Indian joint ventures and uh, even some uh, United States firms. It's very green. Did that used to be sort of dusty soil? This used to be desert. Wow. With no water. Looks like a tea plantation. <laughs> It's very nice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. And what they've done is that they're perfecting like uh, much of India now in water harvesting. And so actually I interviewed, and we'll have uh, him on probably in the next few weeks, the Minister of Water Conservation and Water Resources and Irrigation. Mm. That's his official title. That's an interesting minister. And uh, he has a few more portfolios than that. Uh, but virtually all the states, the 29 states now, have a minister somehow for water because it's that precious and with 1.4 billion almost people uh, water is you know is the essence of life but uh, this is this is I was here four days in this uh, facility and if you go around this big circle and, and down the back of that 
Uh, that was actually where I was uh, stationed there to do the uh, television interviews and had a chance to walk around this whole thing for four days. And it's just an amazing, great, amazing, amazing wow. place. And uh, much research is going on there. And so the world actually is coming to Baramonte and because of what the uniqueness of that and what's going on mm. and how they're doing, you know, the vegetables, the row crops like sugarcane mm -hmm. and maize and all those kinds of things. So, wow. anyway, this will give you uh, a close-up of uh, the headquarters of this place. And you find these KVKs. These are uh, uh, at the, um, uh, all over the country. These are uh, nonprofits. And so the whole thing is, is that we need to have this uh, uh, integrated into society, and that's what the Indians are actually doing. I like their green wheat logo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, this is actually nice. for the, uh, the country of uh, India itself. And uh, this is a grain, so this could be wheat, could be rice, it mm. could be uh, whatever. Grain. But uh, their whole thing about it, it's... Uh, and this is something that uh, this particular group we're talking about right now in Badramanti with the Agricultural Development Trust, uh, the, the first lady of this has actually started a program for women to integrate them into uh, business, small business, uh, education to make sure they're fully educated, and then to uh, give them uh, funding and all that as far as the, um, the young girls and so they're trying to teach them the principles of entrepreneurship. Great, and micro loans, things like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Fantastic. And that's very important. But this is the kind of things you see. Now you're, you, you give seminars and all that. Tell me what you see in, in all this. What, what do you see happening here? See a lot of uh, students paying rapt attention, which is good. Mm -hmm. um, I see diversity in the mix. Is that men and women? Uh, you have. Uh, it's hard to tell from. The yeah, I don't think you'll plant. see that. You will then uh, right. a couple but, other frames. Very you have uh, there. modern, uh, urban looking too. Yeah. Very contemporary. And what they're doing here, this is they they bring in farmers from all over India, mm -hmm. and so this this research facility and all that is going, you know, twenty almost twenty four seven three sixty five. I stayed in one of the guest houses they had there, one of the first. It was very very nice. And uh, then they had larger ones that they keep expanding, really? bring more people in. And yeah. then they have dormitories for a lot of the farmers. It's a uh, well attended in. class, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, they, uh, you have to uh, get on a waiting list, you know, to get into this. Oh, wow. So, and a lot of this, too, if you're looking at like the bottom two pictures, a lot of this is what's called train the trainer. So they'll bring uh, right. two or three of the leaders out of a uh, community, say it's 5,000, 10,000 people. They send them back in, and then they share that with the farmers there because the farmers will listen to other farmers. So the classes specifically are on how to grow crops better, Could be anything. utilize water. Could be, oh. It would be how, okay. you know, water conservation, uh, forestation, uh, uh, could be uh, green building principles. Mm -hmm. I mean, anything that's going to impact the farmer. So, you know, it goes from, you know, house to the fields, to the barns, to the, the cattle and, and all that. And very modern facilities. And, of course, when you go out to the farm, some of these are just like your step back a thousand years. Right. But at the same time, you know, they're doing very modern things. And this will give you an idea of uh, what you see as far as these hot houses are concerned. So, you know, they have tomatoes and they have, you know, all kinds of peppers and capsicum. How large are those the tubes are those small uh, these are actually point? very small because there's no oh. earth and there's no dirt in there the, uh, yeah no dirt off. in that but a neat the, idea uh, but the, the, as far as these uh, you know the growth bags that they have there this mm -hmm. is one of the gentlemen that we actually interviewed and what they do is they put this over the plants they grow like three times larger than ones wow. that are just exposed mm -hmm. to the normal outside uh, air and all that uh, it's all drip irrigation mm -hmm. They control the fertilizer, so they're reducing greatly the amount of chemicals that are going into the plants because they want to uh, reduce the amount of the uh, insecticides, pesticides, the residue 
as far as you know the, the plants themselves that's and that's the, great this is like 4-h produce. with sustainability <laughs> <laughs> is that Very, you uh, yes yeah. this is one of the interviews because uh, we're doing a lot of uh, television interviews uh, this young man is a phd uh, standing in front of me and he and the gentleman around him they're all farmers mm. And they're well educated, and you can see how they're dressed. They're very nicely dressed, mm -hmm. uh, very well-meaning and purposeful. Uh, but they they have started their own social media platform, Fantastic. and so they're now I think they're at uh, fifty thousand and growing, you know, by thousands, you know, on a month-to-month -month basis. Mm -hmm. And this is only for farmers, and they're Great. getting it out. So they're talking about uh, financing markets. Uh, how to grow, how to conserve water. I mean, water just keeps coming up over and over. And then right behind me, over, uh, you know, behind me, are you see more of those growth bags we're talking about. Yeah. And it's just amazing how the difference it makes as far as uh, what's going on. And then getting back to uh, the women, you can see these sewing machines. Uh, and what they're doing is that they're not just uh, dealing with the, the male farmers. And what we found is that there's actually more and more women that are becoming Small farmers themselves. Which oh, they're is, farmers. Yeah, yeah. It, they're, they're farmers themselves. And uh, they're doing it uh, on their own, which is, you know, a, a total switch from, you know, what you think about over right. there. But they also want the, the women in these villages to have more uh, opportunities to earn their own income. And I'm assuming these are the pedal-powered Yes. Sewing machines, yes. not yeah. electric, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because a lot of the, even though you see electrification, I mean, you're in a village, mm -hmm. and actually the power lines are going over top of your head, it doesn't mean they're hooked in. <laughs> no power. Well, <laughs> and, and they also have, you know, certain hours of the day. So you may have power for three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon or evening, and then you have two or three hours where they've actually switched, turned it, and giving it to another community. And so, uh, because of just the tremendous demand for energy, uh, it's it, being rationed. It, I understand it, but regardless of that, it's very environmentally friendly to mm -hmm. have foot-powered sewing machines. Yeah. We yeah. should do more of that. Absolutely. And uh, these are some of the experimental gardens they have there, is how do you grow this uh, bigger, better, faster, more nutritious, with far less uh, chemicals? Is that corn being used? On the Part top of left? it, yeah, yeah. Uh, Those are large corn, stalks. yes. Well, and uh, what you find is that uh, much of the vegetables, you know, what we consider a head of cauliflower here, maybe this big, you know, what they are looking for is maybe two to three mm. times the size of that. Uh, wow. You know, watermelons, you know, just huge, and cantaloupes, and uh, and the tomatoes, and uh, again, this will all come out in some of the future. Um, television programs we're going to broadcast and this is how to grow you know more fruit and to reduce again everything is reduce the use of chemicals of all kinds mm -hmm. reduce the amount of water and increase productivity and increase the uh, the value of the crops so it's just uh, amazing what they're they're doing over there and this is just going on day in and day out and this is the areas where they're doing the uh, water harvesting uh, putting in a check dam and then they put the have these underground wells that they're just filling with water whenever they get wow. rains because nice. it may rain for two or three months and you don't get it for the mm. you know next nine months. Fantastic. So Richard Lewis, thank you for being with us on thank the Emerald Planet TV. Me. Thank you for uh, coming up with some of this information and uh, the slides that you're willing to share with us. And thank you, dear viewers, for being with us as we're looking around the globe, along with Richard Lewis, as we create the Emerald Planet.